Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman with Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here today. I am thrilled to be able to tell you that we are now syndicated across California, reaching over 30 million people. If you have any questions you would like answered, please reach out to questions at insurancehour.com. You can also call 559-656-0317. If you miss any part of this show, you're not able to finish the entire thing, you can catch us on any podcast app you can think of. Also on iHeartMedia, you can catch us on YouTube. Just search for Insurance Hour and you will find us, I promise you. Today, we're going to talk a little bit in general about insurance and how it works, what it is, what it's used for, why the prices are what they are, and as importantly, why the prices are going up. Phone lines are open, so remember you can call in anytime if you have a specific question you'd like to discuss, 559-656-0317. So let's dive into this foray that everybody loves, insurance. How does insurance work and what is the design concept about? So in general, there is a feeling that in order for us to be able to grow, whether we want to invest in a new business, we want to start a new venture, we want to do anything, there's inherent risk, right? If we're going to start a new business, for example, there's the risk that what? The business will fail. Or there's a risk that while you're running your business, there might be some type of a loss. That loss might be a fire. That loss might be theft. That loss might be one of your suppliers is no longer in business and you're no longer able to keep up with making your product. Similarly, for an individual, let's say you're buying a home. Once you buy that home, you are going to be putting a lot of money into that investment. That is, for most people, their primary asset that they have is their home. So they have as an individual, we have, let's say, property, for example. And as a business, we have a business. There are two types of exposures that we can talk about. So someone that has a house, they have all of their money in that house. The last thing they want to have happen is to have all of that money, all of that investment disappear. Now, that can happen where, <laughs> for a number of different ways. Let's just take fire. That's where insurance began. That's where its roots came from. It had to do with insuring against fire. As a matter of fact, the Hartford Insurance Company is famously known for insuring Abraham Lincoln's log cabin against the peril of, you guessed it, fire. So how does that work? How does an insurance company take, let's say, a small amount of money and in essence have enough to pay a much larger amount of money in the event that you need it in the event there's a claim that's going to mean that they're going to have to pay money to you. Now, I'm going to talk about, let's talk about good old Abe's log cabin for the sake of discussion. It's a little more interesting than just talking about my house or your house, right? So we're going to be using numbers that don't obviously make sense for back in those days, but I'm going to use round, simple numbers. Let's say that it costs $1,000 for Abraham Lincoln to rebuild that log cabin, $1,000. Now, that's a lot of money. Let's call that a million dollars today, right? But for sake of our discussion, let's call it a thousand dollars. Now, good old Abe says, I, I've put a lot of money into this, about a thousand dollars, maybe more, to be able to have this log cabin. If it burns down, I'm in deep doo doo. I'm out a thousand dollars. I don't want that. What can I do? How can I protect that asset? What developed was a concept that if Abe's willing to part with a little bit of money, then he'll have a promise from an insurance company that in the event there is a fire, they will step in and they will pay that $1,000 to rebuild that log cabin. Let's say he's paying $5. So for $5 a year, good old Abe is going to, or Honest Abe, right? For your history buffs, I think they called him Honest Abe. For $5 a year, he's going to pay an insurance company and that insurance company is going to take that $5 and hold on to it. And in the event that log cabin burns down, they're going to pay $1,000 to rebuild that log cabin. The first thing that goes through the logical mind is, well, how can that possibly work? How can an insurance company take $5 today and have $1,000 tomorrow? I'd like that business model. I'd like to figure out how I can take that money and actually 
make it appear to be that much larger right after. So here is one of the ways insurance companies will take that $5 and they'll have enough money to be able to pay for that loss of $1,000 in our example. First of all, Abe's not going to have the only log cabin. There will be other log cabins that they will be insuring. They might insure another log cabin for $5, another log cabin for $5, maybe another log cabin somewhere else for $10. Maybe there's a mansion of a log cabin and they'll charge $15. Maybe they'll charge $2 for another. They're going to be insuring other log cabins and collecting additional premium. Now, we stop and we look at that and we say, okay, so are you saying that they're going to be, they meaning the insurance company, is going to collect enough money in premium that they can pay for that thousand dollars? The answer is yes and no. Yes, meaning that they are going to have enough assets on hand or access to those assets to be able to pay that thousand dollar loss. Part of it is going to come from the fact that they are collecting all of those premiums from different people for their log cabins, right? Now, what would they not want to do? they would probably not want to insure all of the log cabins in one particular neighborhood. Because what could happen then? If there's a fire, they wouldn't potentially just have the exposure of losing one log cabin. They would have the exposure of losing potentially a whole bunch of them. So they would have a $1,000 claim, another $1,000 claim, a $500 claim. They would have all these claims that would be coming all at the same time. That's something that an insurance company wants to avoid. They don't want to have a loss that's going to put them in financial jeopardy. They want to be sure that there's enough money to pay claims as they happen. So the first thing that an insurance company will do to try and ensure that it has sufficient assets to pay for all of the claims that it has exposure to is it will try and separate that risk pool. So they're going to try and diversify, if you want to look at it that way. They're going to say, well, we're going to insure a couple of log cabins in this area, a couple of log cabins in that area, some way far away. They're going to try and spread the risk so that in the event of one particular loss, they're not going to all of a sudden be hit with a ton of claims and be in a position where they might not have enough money. Now, that's just the first thing that an insurance company can do proactively from minute one to try and put themselves in a better position to be able to have money on hand in the event there is a claim. We're gonna take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some other ways that insurance companies will go about being sure they have enough money to pay claims. And yes, this impacts us even today. These concepts that are utilized are utilized today. As far back as good old Honest Abe's log cabin, we are still seeing them today. We'll be back in two seconds. We are Insurance Hour. I am Carl Sussman. We'll be back in a flash. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Greg. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the windowtothemagic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello, Carl Sussman here, Insurance Hour. Thank you once again for being here. Remember, if you have questions, you can reach out anytime at 559-656-0317. You can also send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Also, if you're looking to get an answer right away, you need to talk to somebody, you can dial pound 250 on your cell phone, use the keyword insurance, and that will transfer you to an agent right away. If you miss any part of the show, don't worry, you can catch us on any podcast aggregator you can imagine. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, you can find us on iHeartRadio, just search for Insurance Hour. You can even go on YouTube if you really want to see what I look like today and search for Insurance Hour. You'll be able to find the videos there and a whole collection of previous videos with a ton of good information. Before the break, we were talking about how insurance carriers 
ensure that they have enough money on hand to pay insurance claims. We were talking about one of the concepts called diversification or spreading the risk, meaning that the insurance carrier is going to take not one risk in one area only, but they're not going to take every risk in the same area either. They're going to spread that risk around. So they're going to collect premium. They're going to have that premium. Now, how else are they going to be sure? Because let's just face it, those small dollar amounts, those $5 premiums are going to take a long time to be able to add up. You have to sell an awful lot of log cabin policies to be able to add up enough to be able to rebuild the log cabin, right? So how else does an insurance company ensure that they have sufficient funds? Another way that they do that is they will take that money, that $5 in this example, all of the premiums that are being paid in, and they won't just put it under their mattress. They're going to take it and they're going to invest it. This is what's called investment income. So an insurance company takes your premium and they invest it. They put it somewhere that's going to generate more money. Now, when we're in an environment where interest rates are low, and they had been for a very long time, that investment income number is fairly non-existent. Remember, they can't take that money and put it into high risk investments, high risk, high return, because at the end of the day, they need to be sure their money is secure. They need to be sure that they have money to pay our claims. That's the most important thing. What they're trying to do is find the correct balance between how much money can they generate on the money that's sitting in their coffers while at the same time being sure they have sufficient funds on hand to do that? What does that look like in practice? Well, there are regulations in different states that mandate the types of investments that an insurance company is allowed to make with your money while they're holding on to it. For the most part, you're going to see some type of a mix of stocks and bonds. Stocks being more risky, bonds being less risky. Also, they're going to look at things like treasuries, investments that are considered almost, um, what's the right way of putting it? I don't want to get into the financial facet of any of this. I'm not a financial advisor, so don't go there. Those are the, let, let's just say I'm comfortable saying, I think that the treasury bills are probably on the low end of risk, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it when you watch the news. So the insurance carrier is going to take the, the premiums that they're collecting for all of these, the example we're using if you're just joining us, all of the premiums for all of the log cabins, and they're going to take that and they're going to put it into some stocks, into some bonds, into some T-bills. So now they're going to have money they've accumulated in premium, they're going to have money that they've accumulated and they're going to have some of it invested in stocks, some of it is invested in bonds, some of it in T-bills. So those premium dollars are going to slowly be growing. So now they're not just having access to your premium dollars to pay claims, they're also going to have access to the interest and the additional money that they've accumulated based on those investments that they've made. Pretty cool. Well, pretty cool for them, but pretty cool for us as well. Because if an insurance company was not able to invest your premium to generate more income, they would have to increase the premium, right? Remember, the goal is to have enough money on hand to pay the claim when the claim happens. And an insurance carrier has to try and forecast the likelihood of a loss happening and factor that in to what they're charging for the premium. Back to good old Abraham Lincoln's log cabin. If his log cabin is somewhere that's likely to burn, let's say it's right in the middle of the forest, they're going to have to charge a higher premium because the likelihood of it burning is higher than if it were, I don't know, did they have cities back then? I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say. Well, let's just say he built the log cabin somewhere that was further away from the forest, less likely to burn. If it's less likely to burn, they can charge a lower premium. But all of this has to be a balancing act between how much premium are they collecting from all of the log cabin owners how much are they generating on their investment income, right? That money that they're generating from the stocks, the bonds, the T-bills, whatever other investments they're making. And how likely is it they're going to need how much money in the event of a loss? If it's one loss, if it's one log cabin, maybe someone's visiting their friend in a log cabin, they're smoking a cigarette, they fall asleep, that place burns down. One log cabin. Insurance companies don't usually have too much trouble with that. They have plenty of premium all by itself to take care of one claim. What they're concerned about, what they're really trying to be prepared for is the event that something catastrophic happens. 
We're seeing this countrywide. We're seeing catastrophic events that are happening weekly, if not more. And a catastrophic event is something that's going to take out not one location or one vehicle, but a lot of them. And we can go into more details about what definitions there are that determine if it's a catastrophic loss or just a bad loss or just a, an event or how that works. It's interesting, a little nerd like for me, uh, insurance nerd likes that stuff, you might not, but maybe we'll touch on that later. Let's just make it simple and say that an insurance company wants to be prepared for the worst. Nothing could be worse for an insurance carrier than if you or I file a claim and they don't have the money. There are protections in place to be able to prevent that from happening. Every state has different regulations that tell an insurance carrier how much money they need to have liquid, meaning how much they have to literally have in the bank ready to pay claims, how much of that money they're allowed to invest, and the types of investments they have, how liquid are they? How quickly can they get that money back, right? If they're putting money into a financial instrument that locks it up, in essence, does not give them access to that, the regulations are going to say, okay, only X percentage of your premium dollars that you're holding on to can go into those particular financial instruments because we want to be sure in the event of a claim, you are liquid. You can pay those claims. So taking the premium, investing it, highly regulated, it's regulated by each state, and every insurance company has their own sort of feelings about it. Some carriers tend to be more aggressive with how they invest their money, and some tend to be more conservative. You would suspect that the carriers that are more conservative, meaning they're not generating as much on their investment income, are probably going to be the ones that are also charging a slightly higher premium because money has to come from somewhere, right? If they're being less risky with their investments, then they're going to have to counterbalance that with probably higher premiums and at the same time, more risk. Let's talk about another way that insurance carriers can go about protecting and being sure they have money for your claims as soon as we come back. In today's uncertain times, navigating the California insurance marketplace can feel like a journey through uncharted waters. That's where Sussman Insurance Agency steps in, guiding you with the wisdom of experience and the care of family. We at Sussman Insurance Agency understand the complexities of finding the right coverage in these challenging times. With decades of expertise and a heritage spanning two generations, we're more than just insurance agents. We are your trusted advisors, your navigators in the sea of insurance options. Treating our clients like family isn't just a phrase, it's our commitment. We listen, we understand, and we provide solutions tailored to your unique needs. Why? Because to us, you're a part of the Sussman family. Don't let the tides of uncertainty sway you. Anchor your trust in Sussman Insurance Agency. Call us today at 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Have specific questions? Drop us an email at sales at sussmaninsurance.com. At Sussman Insurance Agency, we're not just in the business of policies. We're in the business of peace of mind. Sussman Insurance Agency, navigating your insurance life together. Hello, hello, this is Carl Sussman with Insurance Hour. Welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, if you've missed any part of this show, you can find it everywhere. Just search for Insurance Hour either on a podcast app or on YouTube, iHeartMedia, you name it, I'm out there. You'll find us. If you have questions you'd like to talk, the phones are open, 559-656-0317. If you get a voicemail, that usually means that the lines are busy. Make sure you leave a message. I will address your call question either on the air next time, or if you like, I can send you an email. And speaking of emails, you can also email your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. If you wanna to talk to an agent right now, as in this very second, just dial pound 250 on your cell phone, use the keyword insurance, and that will transfer you through to an agent that can help you, hopefully. Before the break, uh, we were talking about how does an insurance company take your premium and have enough money, potentially the very next day, to pay for a loss that is significantly larger in cost than the premium you're paying. We've been using the example of Abraham Lincoln's log cabin. We were saying that that would cost about $1,000 to rebuild, and we were estimating that he's paying about $5 a year to have insurance on it. We talked about two ways that an insurance company goes about preventing themselves from running out of money. Let's talk about another one. It's called reinsurance. Now, what is reinsurance? Reinsurance is basically an insurance company that insures an insurance company. Mind-blowing, right? You might be saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
I already have insurance. I've selected my insurance company. I, I don't know who they're going with. I, you mean they're taking my money and they're giving it to another insurance company? Ah, deep sigh, everybody. Yes, they are in fact doing that. But let me explain because it's actually a really good thing. Here's how reinsurance works. Let's take that same $1,000 replacement cost for a Blinken log cabin, $5 premium that he's paying every single year. Insurance company takes that $5 and says, you know, I, I, I would like to share this risk maybe with some of my fellow insurance carriers. In this case, those are called reinsurers. So they're going to say, you know, I'm going to take $2.50 of this $5 and I'm going to pass this on to another company. I'm going to tell them, look, I'm going to give you $2.50 and if there's a claim, will you pay half? I pay half. So premium comes in, it's $5. $2.50, I'm going to keep. $2.50, you're going to get. In the event of that $1,000 claim, I'll pay $500, you'll pay $500. Now, why is that a good thing for us as consumers? The reason is now, remember we've been talking about how this is all under the auspice of be sure the insurance carrier does not run out of money, right? That's the big thing we're looking for. Now, what do you think is better for a consumer? To have their insurance with one insurance company that has to take on all of the risk or to have it with more than one insurance company? Let's say in this example, two and they split the risk. Logically, it seems that, well, if they spread the risk with more insurance companies, there are more total assets there, which means that at the end of the day, there's more money to be there and back that loss that you might potentially have. So insurance companies use reinsurers, number one, to be able to have less exposure for themselves, and at the same time, it protects us as consumers because they're spreading that risk. You might even find an insurance company that has multiple reinsurers. For this example, this carrier might decide to take that $5 premium and get rid of $3 of the five, even four. Maybe they're only keeping $1 and the rest is each dollar is going to a different insurance company, a different reinsurance company. Now, that might sound insane to you, but what this does it gives the insurance carrier the ability to take more risk because it's spreading its own risk with all of these other insurance companies. Now, it's also important to understand that there's a cost associated with this. There's what's called a reinsurance cost. So they're not literally giving the 250, $2.50 in this example, to the other carrier. They have to give them $2.50 and some additional fee. There's a cost to make this type of a play, if you want to call it that. There's a cost to the insurance carrier to purchase reinsurance. It's literally called purchasing reinsurance. So that $2.50 might actually be closer to $2.75. So there's a premium that the insurance carrier is paying to another insurance company, just like you and I pay an insurance company a premium the insurance company is paying a premium to be able to have the ability to share that risk with another insurance company. I find it fascinating, especially when you realize, and you're gonna love this, sometimes an insurance company will sell off 100% of the premium to a number of insurance companies. And you might be saying, wait a minute, what possible benefit would an insurance company have to do that? Well, let's imagine that it's a new type of investment, a new type of business, and this insurance carrier is not sure if it's going to be profitable or not. So instead of putting its own money at risk, it takes all of the money that it's collecting in premium, all of it. It's selling it to other reinsurance companies, and it's sitting back and relaxing and saying, all right, let's watch this for a while and see if this business is profitable. And if it is, they'll say, okay, next year I'm going to take a little less reinsurance. I'll keep some of that risk on my own books. I'm going to make a little more money that way. So they have the ability to try different things and get in different markets because they're not limited by their own piggy bank. They're limited only by their ability to purchase reinsurance and the reinsurance market in general and how willing they are to take on the risk. Remember, it's easier to find two companies willing to take a smaller risk than one company to take a larger risk, which, which makes sense. But remember that insurance, that reinsurance premium we spoke about? Right, that's important because how does that work if the carrier is paying that premium? 
has to come from somewhere, right? Typically, in all states in the country, minus one, I won't say which, the cost of reinsurance cannot be calculated in the premium that's charged to consumers, which means the insurance carrier has to find some other way to recuperate that premium that they're paying because we want to, as consumers, again, we, we recognize now, right? Reinsurance is good for us. It means we, that there's more backing, there's more insurance companies, there's more money behind us having a potential claim. So we want to encourage that behavior. We don't want one company to hold on to all the risk for itself because if there's a big loss, we're out of luck. So carriers will find a way, and like I said, in all but one state, they're able to take that additional, I think we said it was about a buck 75 in reinsurance premium. What they're paying for the ability to pass that risk on in part to another carrier and, com and uh, compute that into part of the premium they're charging for clients. Now, I wanna talk about some more ways that companies are ensuring they have enough cash to help you in the event of a claim. There are lots of them. We'll cover more right after the break. I'm Carl Sussman, and you are tuned in to Insurance Hour. We will be back in a flash. I'm sure many small business owners out there have been hearing a lot about tax advisory, but aren't quite sure what it is or how it can help. Let Semaphore guide you and help fulfill your tax advisory needs at SemaphoreHQ.com. A tax advisor is a part-time, on-demand financial expert who can help you with scaling and tracking your financials and making smart financial decisions. How do you know if you need tax advisory? The answer depends on your stage, size, and goals. Tax advisory can help you address these issues without the cost or commitment of hiring a full-time CFO. A tax advisor can work with you on a project basis, a retainer basis, or a hybrid basis, depending on your needs and budget. If you are interested in learning more about how tax advisory can help you scale your business, please contact Semaphore today at 720-766-8869 or check us out at semaphorehq.com. That's S-E-M-A-P-H-O-R-E-H-Q.com. Hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman, and thank you again for being here and listening to Insurance Hour. We are here. We are here and there and everywhere. It sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. You can find this live on great stations all across California. We are reaching more than 30 million people now, I'm proud to say. If you miss the show live, you can always catch it as a podcast on any podcast app you can possibly imagine. And in addition to that, you can find us on YouTube. Just search for Insurance Hour. Now, before the break, we were talking about different ways that an insurance company goes about ensuring they have enough money to pay your claims. And we talked about three different ways. Let's talk about another way. So remember, we're using the example of Abraham Lincoln and his log cabin. And we're saying that his cost to rebuild that cabin is about $1,000. And we're estimating that he's paying about $5 a year to be able to have that insurance policy. We talked about different ways that an insurance carrier can be sure that that $5 is magically turned into $1,000 day two in the event that that log cabin burns down. Again, if you missed it, go back, listen to the show on a podcast or on YouTube, and we'll fill you in on how that magic works. Let's talk about another way they do it. It's called loss prevention. So let's talk about this. Now, what do you think would be the ideal customer for an insurance company? Well, that's easy. We can be cynical and say, well, one that pays pays premium all day long and never pays a claim. You got it. That is the ideal client because an insurance company can collect the premium. It can have the reinsurance. It can do all of these things to generate income and not have to pay claims. So an insurance carrier would love to do everything humanly possible to be sure that you don't have a claim. So loss prevention is the pattern and the process that it goes through to try and assist clients, customers, us, consumers, in trying to prevent losses from happening. Sometimes this feels backwards. It feels like you're being forced to do things that you might not otherwise want to do. So that's actually, I mean, that's one way of looking at it. But let's remember that the goal is not to have a loss, right? Yes, the insurance carrier would prefer we don't have a loss, but we would kind of prefer not to have a loss as well, right? At the end of the day, no loss means no loss. Loss is bad. We would like to avoid that. 
So insurance carriers will utilize loss prevention techniques by giving us guidelines, sometimes quite firmly, meaning do this or we will not insure you. They will give us guidelines of things that we can do to try and prevent losses. Since we're talking about fire, we're talking about good old Abraham Lincoln's log cabin, what might an insurance carrier request or mandate Abe do? Well, one thing they might do is say, okay, Abe, we want to be sure that your fireplace, you know, the chimney that goes all the way up, has a spark arrestor on top. Now, a spark arrestor is basically a fancy name for a grill that's going to keep the embers from flying out of the top of the fireplace, hitting and landing on the roof and burning the log cabin down. Seems pretty logical, right? Embers, and we'll talk about this at another time, is one of the, it's one of the most transmittable ways a fire jumps from house to house and from location to location. It's literally the size of a pixel on your screen. It's a hot ember. That's all it takes carried through the air to be able to pass that fire on. So the insurance carrier might say, you need to have a spark arrestor because they know through experience that embers cause fire. Fire is bad. Fire is a claim. And for us, a claim is bad. And for the insurance company, a claim is bad. What else might they do? Well, if they're also covering other things other than fire on this log cabin, they might also say, well, you know, we're also going to be covering theft. So if somebody breaks into your house and steals something, you have coverage for that as well. So what might they say, what might they use as a loss prevention tool to be sure or try and help you prevent having a loss? Well, they might say, uh, please be sure you lock your front door, right? That's a given. But they might also say, we want you to have a deadbolt lock. We don't want you to just have a chain, right? We've all watched the movies. How hard is it to get through a door with a chain? One little kick, boom. They might say they want you to have deadbolt locks. They might want you to have an alarm system. Okay, you got me. No alarm systems back in the days of Abraham Lincoln, but you see where I'm going with this. They're, they're going to give us guidelines of things that we can do to make our home less likely to suffer a loss from a burglary. Again, two ways to look at it. One is they're making me do something I don't want to do. And the other is by doing these things, I'm less likely to have, let's say it again, a loss. And a loss is, let's say it again, bad. I feel like we're having one of those moments where it's like, take another shot. He's saying loss is bad. I have to tell you, I've been doing this for 30 years. And it surprises me because sometimes when you ask a consumer like me, like you, what would you prefer? A covered loss or no loss? My mind says, of course, no loss. Some people actually would prefer a covered loss. And when I ask why, the rationale is, well, I've been paying for premium, I've been paying premium, and this way I get some of that money back. Remember, insurance policies are not savings accounts. They're not designed to be there to put money in and take money out later. That's not how it works. It's supposed to be there in the event something bad and unexpected and tragic happens, you have some way to try and recoup financially to be able to come back from that loss. So remember that when you hear me continually saying, loss is bad, it's really a little tongue in cheek because as obvious as that sounds, sometimes for some reason, we're in this mode, this mentality as a society where we don't actually seem to take that. We would prefer to have a claim paid than just not have a loss altogether. Let me tell you, even the best claims adjusters, even the best insurance companies, the best insurance agents and brokers, the best of the best will tell you, having a claim, having a loss is never an, an experience you want to have. Even if you have white glove service, you have the best possible service, the best communication. They're not asking a lot of questions. They're just writing checks. They're doing, You've lost something. Something bad has happened. Someone has broken into your home. Some damage has happened to your home. Your car has been in a car accident. There's mental bandwidth that you're expending having to deal with having that, that claim, that loss. So loss prevention is probably one of the most important facets of what an insurance carrier does. And it doesn't just help them. It helps us because... All right, one more time. Loss is bad. I'm going to try not to say that anymore, but no promises. So all of these things that we're told to do not only help us prevent losses, it helps the insurance carrier have less claims. And that means, back to our 
the, our topic of the day, it's going to mean they're going to have more money on hand to pay the claims that inevitably still will happen. Now, there are some other things that insurance carriers can do to try and ensure they have enough money to pay your claims. We'll talk about them after the break. Remember, you can call in with questions anytime at 559-656-0317 or send in your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. If you want to talk to an agent right now, just dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and you will get transferred to an agent right away. We will be back in a flash. We all love children, and many of us have an old car, truck, or van in the driveway. Find the Children has a great way for you to put your unwanted vehicle to good use. Keep listening. Every year, thousands of kids go missing. Trust me, it's a parent's worst nightmare. When a child goes missing, every moment counts, and you need all of the help you can get. Find the Children is a nonprofit organization dedicated to locating missing children and bringing them home safely. You can help support their mission by donating your car, truck, van, or SUV. A towing company will come and pick up your car for free, running or not, and the donation of your car is tax deductible. Your help is providing the funds they need to continue their services. Call now, donate your old vehicle to find the children and get free pickup. Here's the number. 800-403-6517. 800-403-6517. 800-403-6517. That's 800-403-6517. Hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman, and welcome back to Insurance Hour. We are here answering your questions, informing, educating, and entertaining everybody when it comes to insurance. Hopefully, the entertaining is happening as well, because let's face it, insurance is so exciting. Uh, I have to work overtime to try and find an interesting way to make it entertaining for you, but I am trying. Let me know how I'm doing. You can email at questions at insurancehour.com. You can also call in at 559-656-0317. Or if you need to talk to an agent right away, you can dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and you'll get through to somebody right away. If you've missed any part of this show, don't worry. You can catch it. You can go find it. It's on pretty much every podcast aggregator. You can find every podcast app, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, all that good stuff. And also on YouTube. If you feel like staring at me while I'm chatting, you can go on YouTube, search for Insurance Hour. You can find us there. Do the obligatory, please subscribe and push the thumbs up or whatever other fun stuff happens there. So we're talking about ways that insurance carriers ensure they have enough money to pay your claim. That's what we've been talking about this hour. And let's face it, we take for granted the fact that we're paying a small amount of money. I get it. Premiums have gone crazy. It's for another show. But for right now, we're paying a significantly smaller premium than the insurance carriers promising, contractually promising, to pay us in the event of a claim. So how do they do that? What's that magic? How does that happen where they take a little bit of money and they can have enough to pay your claim the very next day? We've talked about all those. Again, go back, listen. If you missed the beginning part of the show, we talked about some of them. Now, something else I wanted to talk about along this same line is how does an insurance company ensure that they don't get hit with a claim or a set of claims that they simply cannot afford? And that's called loss avoidance. Now, we talked about loss prevention just in the previous segment, which is the insurance carrier giving suggestions slash mandates of things we have to do to try and prevent a loss from happening. But the general concept of insurance tells us that An insurance carrier has to decide what's the likelihood of a loss happening. They have to charge a premium that that is competitive, that will also give them the ability, using some of the tools we talked about, to be able to have enough money to pay that claim. The question is, is that always possible? Is every risk out there, every single home, every single car, every single driver, whatever it might be, is there a premium that an insurance carrier can charge, that they can justify and they can actually find a way to know that if they charge that premium, they are going to have sufficient money in the bank to pay the claims. And I've got some surprising news for you, surprising news for a lot of people that get very upset by this. The answer is no. There are absolutely some risks that cannot be insured. Mic drop. Let me just say it again. There are certain risks that cannot be insured. 
This seems a little bit contrary to what we're talking about all along, right? We're talking about what carriers are doing with your money, how they're investing it, how they're helping prevent losses, how they're spreading the risk with other insurance companies, all these things. And now I'm coming out and saying, oh, but by the way, this might not work in every situation. The answer is yes, this might not work in every situation because there are some losses, there are some exposures that are so catastrophic, that are so unpredictable or just such a high risk that the the premium that would need to be charged in order to get enough premium in to do all of those things, to have enough money on hand is just unreasonable. An example might be if you're insuring something for half a million dollars and the premium in order to make that carrier have enough money on hand is $200,000, you're going to say to yourself pretty quickly, wait a minute. So in two and a half years or so, I will have paid enough premium to do this, re, to rebuild this myself. Yeah, probably not going to be a policy you're going to want to take unless you're very concerned that in the next year or two, there's going to be a loss. So how does that happen and what are you supposed to do? Understand that if an insurance company is declining to take the risk, and that's the point, that's what we're talking about this segment, it's loss avoidance. They're going to avoid that loss altogether by not accepting it in the first place. What does that tell you and what do you do? Well, the first thing is, remember, an insurance company only makes money by selling insurance, taking your money, investing it, paying claims, and having enough left over where they have a profit margin. So all of that starts with, rewind, selling insurance. So if an insurance company is declining to sell insurance, that should be a red flag for you. Okay, this is a tough risk. This is a risk that's so bad that it breaks the entire insurance model. You can't find an insurance company that's willing to or able to charge a premium for that risk. That should tell you something. That should tell you that this is a pretty big risk because the entire industry is built around selling insurance policies, collecting premium. If they are declining to do so, the only reason they could possibly be doing that is because they're seeing that they cannot charge premium sufficient to cover that exposure and at the same time have something left over for themselves as a profit margin. What do you do then? Well, you have two choices. You either what's called self-insure, which is exactly what it sounds like. You don't have insurance, so if there's a loss, you're the one that's paying for it. That's called self-insuring. Or you don't take that risk either. Sometimes when I'm talking with clients and they're talking about making a purchase of a piece of property, let's say, and it's in a very high risk area. Maybe there have been prior losses on the house itself because the house has some conditional issues, maybe it's some deferred maintenance. I love that expression. Deferred maintenance, AKA, it needs to be rebuilt. Okay, a little harsh, but you get where I'm going. It's going to be a matter of you deciding, well, if the professionals, the insurance carriers, the big brains that are able to look at the big picture and all of this historical data are looking at this risk and they're saying, nope, can't do it. Maybe you should be thinking twice about it as well, or maybe even three times, because they want to do it. If it were possible, they would. That's how they make money. So if an insurance carrier is passing on some risk you are bringing them, you should that should give you pause and you should stop and be able to say to yourself, okay, why is that? Why do they not want to take this risk? Doesn't mean you have to walk away from the risk, but you might want to find out what about it is making the carrier unable to accept the risk. There might be things you can do. If we're talking about a piece of property, it might be that the roof is too old or that it's a type of roof that's you know, likely to burn. If it's, a, if it's a, a auto insurance, it might be that you have so many tickets and accidents that the carrier just does not see the ability to be able to insure you effectively. Well, drive safer, please, right? There are things you can do, but I want you to take advantage of the fact that if an insurance carrier declines you, find out why that is, see if there's something you can do, but most importantly, be aware that that means something. One more segment to go. We're going to wrap all this stuff up. I'm Carl Sussman, and you are tuned in to Insurance Hour. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the magic podcast show will begin. My name is Patrick. 
My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the WindowToTheMagic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello, this is Carl Sussman, and welcome back to Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here with me. We have talked about so much today. Be sure if you missed any part of it that you go back and listen to it from the beginning. You can find us on iHeartMedia. You can find us on any podcast app you want. You can jump on YouTube, search for Insurance Hour. You'll find us there as well. Remember also, if you were not able to get through today, you can call again anytime at 559-656-0317 or send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. If you're looking to talk to an agent right away, just grab the phone, dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and you'll get connected with an agent right away. So in our final segment today, I wanna to sort of wrap all this up and with a bow, put it together. So we were talking about how an insurance carrier can take a small amount of money, relatively speaking, and have enough money to pay your claim right away. We were using the example of Abraham Lincoln's log cabin. We were saying it's going to cost $1,000 to rebuild and he's paying about $500, I'm sorry, $500. He's paying about $5 a year. You see where my brain is, that's the type of, those are the types of dollars that I'm seeing in relation to premiums sometimes these days. It is, it is a tough market for sure. We're all feeling that. We will talk about that in more detail in another show. So we talked about several ways that insurance carriers are, are, are able to perform that magic, if you will. They're able to take that premium and have enough money the next day to pay a claim for you. The first one we talked about was they're collecting your premium and they're collecting your premium from everybody, right? All of the log cabins, all of the other policyholders. The other part they're going to do is take that premium, they're going to invest it and make some money on that money. Lower interest environments, very challenging to do that because there's not a lot of return of premium, not a lot of interest that there was to be gotten. Plus, keep in mind that there are regulatory pressures that permit insurance carriers to only invest so much of that premium into certain types of risks. They can't take all of their premium from you and put it in a high risk hedge fund, for example. They need to have a lot of it on hand and the amount that they're allowed to invest is regulated as well. The next part we talked about was reinsurance, which is the sharing of the, your premium with another insurance company. I can't emphasize enough how important this is, how good this is, because you're paying for you're paying insurance premium and you think you're just getting protected by the financial stability of one company, but you might actually have three or four companies behind it sharing in that risk, and that's a good thing. The next is loss prevention. Things that the insurance carriers tell us to do that piss us off because we have to spend money to do it, but they're doing that because it's going to enable us to prevent having a loss. Remember, we're aligned when it comes to that. We, as consumers, don't wanna have a loss. I won't say it, I have to say it. Loss is bad. If you don't know why I'm saying it that way, go back and listen to the show. Loss is bad. And at the same time, it's bad for the carrier if you have a claim. It's bad for you if you have a claim. So they're going to try and incentivize you either by mandating certain things that you do to make the exposure you're purchasing insurance for less likely to have a claim. Or depending on what it is, they might actually mandate that you actually do these things, right? That's loss prevention. Then there's what's called loss avoidance. And that's where a carrier might come and look at your risk and say, mm, no, pass, next please. And that's the one that surprises people the most because you hear, well, isn't this what insurance carriers do? They take risks, yes, but they can't take every risk. They can't take every exposure because some exposures intrinsically are simply too big. I'll give you an example. Here's a risk that an insurance carrier does not cover today because it is so catastrophic and so unpredictable that they could not possibly charge enough premium for that risk. It's called nuclear war. An insurance carrier, all of the policies you're going to see are going to exclude that from a covered peril. 
The reason is, number one, it's too unpredictable. If there's one thing an insurance carrier does not like, it's unpredictability. The more data they have, the more predictable a loss is, the better they can be prepared, the better they can charge premium correctly, the better they can compete and see who does, who's willing to take more of a risk based on all of that data. When you're talking about that exposure, it's so unpredictable and it would affect so many businesses, so many people, so many claims would come in that there's not an insurance company out there that is able to shoulder that risk. So you'll find that excluded. Now that's an exclusion to basically every insurance policy that's out there. And I'm using that as an example, that there are some risks that simply cannot be underwritten. There's just, just too much exposure and the carriers can't be in a position of offering a product when they know <laughs> that they're not going to have the money in the event a claim comes in like that. So cata catastrophic risks like that sometimes will fall into the category of uninsurable. And what people can do is either avoid those risks themselves, right? That should be a red flag. If an insurance company that makes money by selling insurance is declining to take that risk, that should tell you something about taking that risk as well. However, if it's a situation where it is a risk you wanna take, you can check a lot of times with your particular state that you're living in, and there might be specific avenues for you to pursue to get coverage in some form or another. For example, in California, there's something called the California Fair Plan Association. It offers basic hazard insurance for people that can't obtain fire insurance through the private market. In Florida, there's something called Citizens. Citizens is again, it's a state run organization that mandates coverage so you can get coverage in the event you can't purchase it through the regular market. Other states have their own versions of those types of coverage and those types of programs. Colorado is actually in the process of rolling out a fair plan as well. So you do have options. Now, would you expect those premiums to be low or high? Think about it. You can't get insurance through the private market. You have to go to the state organization to try and find coverage. You should expect that to be expensive because again, they know number one, it's a high risk that no one else is willing to take. And number two, because it's a high risk, the premium is going to be high. So understanding how this works and understanding why it works this way, hopefully helps you get a better feeling for why we're paying the premiums that we're paying today. Why are premiums so much higher today than they were five years ago? We'll talk about that in a different show, but I wanted you to have this foundation so you had an understanding of why is it that carriers are doing certain things that they're doing? Why do they send these memos or these notices that say a recent inspection of your property said, blah, 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 you need to blah, 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 blah. Well, it's to your benefit and their benefit. It's not because they don't wanna write your insurance policy, because they do, that's how they make a living. That's how insurance companies survive, by selling policies. They're doing that because they're trying to make it a risk that they can accept. And again, helping you prevent a claim helps you and helps them. All right, one more time. Because remember, claims and losses are bad. You want a loss to be avoided whenever possible for your sake and theirs. I will close it with that. I am Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for listening to Insurance Hour. We'll talk again soon. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 Six five six zero three one seven. Educating and entertaining Californians, one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. The show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.